Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Mr. Buddy here, and today we're going to be taking a look at another What If Pokemon region. In case you're out of the know, in this video series, I like to talk about hypothetical Pokemon regions that could be made out of real life countries and areas. So far, I've made videos on Greece, the Western US, Australia, and Scandinavia, and in them, I like to go over possible locations that could be included in these What If regions, potential new Pokemon that could be made for them, and of course, the possible stories these What If regions could tell. For today's regional video, we're going to be traveling to the island of Great Britain, and we'll be talking all about what a possible England-based Pokemon region could be like. Now, if you're getting deja vu right now, it's probably because this video is technically a remake of my very first regional video, which was also about an England region. Since making that video, however, my regional video series has really grown and improved, and I felt it was high time that I finally went back and redid that region in the newer style of my What If Blank Was a Pokemon Region videos. Now before I jump into all the ideas and thoughts I have for this region, just a couple of quick notes. Number one, this video is not meant to be speculation on an upcoming Pokemon games region. Most people will probably see this video at different times, and if you're watching this when a new Pokemon game is coming out and the region I'll be talking about today has similarities to an official Game Freak made one, just know that it's all a coincidence and this video was always meant to be just a fun, idea-filled video rather than serious speculation. Number two, please go to the description and check out all the fantastic artists who helped make this video. They're honestly a huge part of my regional videos, and without their help, I can guarantee you these regions wouldn't be anywhere near as awesome as they are. From the characters, to the environments, to the Pokemon, I commissioned a ton of artwork from very talented people, so please go to the description and give the artists the credit they deserve. Number three, please feel free to leave your own ideas and suggestions in the comment section below. Whether you thought of a cool place or Pokemon idea that could be in this England region, or there's a certain country or area you want to see me do a video on, I love reading your guys' comments, so please don't hesitate to share your ideas and thoughts below. Number four, I'm very bad at pronouncing things, so please forgive me for how wrong most of the words are going to sound. In every regional video, I try as hard as I can to pronounce things right, but there's always a lot of words I end up mispronouncing, so please forgive me and just try to laugh at how terrible some of the places are going to sound. Okay, the final thing is that this video is going to be pretty long and extensive, and if you want to jump around between sections, here's some timestamps you can use. Alright, I think that's enough for the intro. We've got a ton of stuff to go over in this video, including ancient castles, new Pokemon based on English folklore, and a story that revolves around control for the region, so let's not waste any more time and get to talking about what England might be like as a Pokemon region. Before we delve into all the big things I thought of for this region, like the specific towns, new Pokemon, and story, we should probably first establish what England is like in terms of its geography, environments, and wildlife, and how it could all translate into a Pokemon region. So England is a country part of what's called the United Kingdom, which is a group of countries consisting of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The UK as a whole is located just off the northwestern coast of France, and England specifically is found just south of Scotland and to the east of Wales. While most of the UK's geography is very mountainous and made of highlands, especially in the northern areas like Scotland, England is somewhat interesting in comparison because it's generally lower and flatter than the three other UK countries, and is made up of mostly rolling hills and grasslands. Even though a large portion of England is made up of these flatter and grassier environments, they aren't the only geographical feature in England, and there are also many other areas in the country that offer a wealth of interesting locales as well. There are still mountainous areas towards the southwestern and northern parts of the country, including some places that get a fair amount of snow, there's some desert-like and arid terrain towards the southeast of the country in the form of the Dungeness Desert, and let's not forget about all the lakes, rivers, and coasts in England too, which them, combined with how much rainfall England gets, means that there are numerous marshes and wetlands scattered throughout the country as well. Also, another thing tied to England's environments that could be featured in an England Pokemon region is that there are many abandoned castles and medieval ruins throughout the country that I think could make for really cool areas to explore. We'll talk more about specific castles and ruins that could be included in the location section, but just to throw the idea out there, I think having some routes with side areas that have old medieval ruins could really make this England region unique. 
Now as for what old Pokemon might inhabit these areas, I've made a pretty big list here, but it's worth noting that while most of the Pokemon I chose for this region are based on what real life animals live in England and their Pokemon counterparts, there are a couple Pokemon I put in just because I think they'd fit into an England region well and don't necessarily have ties to real life England's animals. Okay, so for the grasslands and forests, which would once again take up a pretty large majority of the region, I definitely think there would be Pokemon like Lillipup, Herdier, Stoutland, Pidgey, Pidgeotto, Pidgeot, Pidove, Tranquil, Unpheasant, Mareep, Flaffy, Ampharos, Pikachu, Lediba, Ledian, Burmy, Wormadom, Motham, Pineco, Fortress, Miltank, Hoot Hoot, Noctowl, Dedenne, Weedle, Kakuna, Beedrill, and Eevee, the lake, river, and coastal areas might have things like Goldeen, Sea King, Azuril, Marl, Krogunk, Toxicroak, Ducklet, Swana, Poliwag, Poliwhirl, Alomomola, Phoebus, Meowth, and Persian. The mountainous and arid areas could have Pokemon such as Deerling, Sazbuck, Rockruff, Mudsdale, Durant, Spoink, Grumpig, Cubone, Zubat, Golbat, Noibat, Noivern, Vulpix, Ninetales, Bunnelby, and Diggersby. The icy and snow places could have things like Sneasel, Delibird, Swinub, Piloswine, Snover, Cryogonal, and Snorunt. And the abandoned castle and ruin areas might have Hone Edge, Bronzor, Bronzong, Houndour, Houndoom, Dratini, Dragonair, jingmo o and hakomo o Obviously, I can't go through and name every Pokemon that might inhabit an England region, but these are some of the standout ones I think you might find while you're traveling the region on your Pokemon journey. There's also some other brand new Pokemon I thought of for the region as well, but we'll go over those a little later on in their own section. Now that we've gone over what this England region's environments and old Pokemon could be like, let's now shift our focus over to all the towns and unique locations this England region could have as well. England, as a country, has quite a history to it that spans back thousands of years, and that definitely shows with its cities and landmarks. Some of the bigger cities, like London, have been around since the Roman times, and have very distinct styles and architecture to them that reflects the long line of British monarch eras, while on the flip side of that, there are also numerous smaller villages and towns around the country as well that have popped up relatively recently and offer a more rustic look at England. Outside of the massive cities and smaller villages, there's also a lot of interesting landmarks and non-city locations in England too. Places like Stonehenge, the Lake District, Exmoor, and numerous castle ruins are just a few examples of the many distinct and notable places of interest that can be found in England. For this region, I tried to find a balance between all three of these things. I didn't want to have too many large cities that overshadow some of the smaller, lesser known English villages, and I also tried to strike a balance between the towns in general and the special side areas I thought of for this region. One other thing I want to note before we get into all the places I thought of, is that I have taken a few creative liberties with this region so it's not going to be 100% accurate to real life England. There's a couple towns I ended up combining, the snow area I thought of for this region is a little bit of a stretch, one of the towns literally goes full on steampunk, and there's a few other differences that make this England region not an identical parallel of real life. Even though this England region has a few differences and twists to it, I still feel like I was able to capture the essence and majesty of real life England with this region, and make it feel like what the country could be like in the Pokemon world. Alright, let's begin our tour through this England region with the Starting Town, which is based off of the English city Truro. In real life, Truro is a city located at the convergence of two rivers in the southwestern part of England, and is nestled amidst a lot of farmland. Even though it is somewhat surrounded by grasslands, the city itself isn't necessarily small, and has many points of interest like the Truro Cathedral, a shopping district, and a museum. How I imagine this city in the Pokemon world is a little bit different than what it's like in real life, because I think this town in region could really expand and accentuate the farming aspect of the area. I'm not saying the entire town would just be one big farm, but I think this town could have a couple smaller farms nearby it, one of which is actually where the player would live, and then the rest of the town could have a few buildings in reference to real life Truro, like a small shopping area and maybe a bigger cathedral type building. When it's finally time to leave the starting town, if you head west, this would take you along a route filled with some more farmland areas and low-level Pokemon you can battle, until you reach the western coast of the region, which would loosely be inspired by an area known as Land's End. 
It's here that you would find a location based on the Minic Theater, which is an open-air theater on a cliff overlooking the ocean, and I think this area would serve as an important place you have to go to in the opening of the story. Moving back to the starting town, if you instead head east from it, you would go through another somewhat grassy farmland route, but there would also be a small side area you can visit that resembles a place in England called the Eden Project. The Eden Project is a group of biomes that houses many different types of plants from environments and climates all over the world. I think this area could serve many purposes in the region, and I imagine this being not only a new berry farm type area where you can plant and harvest a plethora of different berries, but I also think this building could allow you to evolve some Pokemon into their Alolan forms as well. Maybe one of the biomes is simulating Alola's environment, and if you evolve certain Pokemon inside of it, like Pikachu or Cubone, they would change into their Alolan variants instead of their regular ones. Once you've finished exploring the many biomes of the Eden Project area and make it through the route, you'll enter a town based on a small village known as Princetown. In real life, Princetown is known mostly for the Dartmoor Prison, which is a large prison nearby, and I think an area based on this prison could be the town's staple area. It might be kind of weird to have an active prison be somewhere you visit in a Pokemon game, so I think the Pokemon World version of the Dartmoor Prison could be abandoned and taken over by nature. Think of places like the Dream Yard or Cinnabar Mansion, and that's sort of what I imagine a Dartmoor Prison area being like. After this, you have a split path of where you go, and if you head north, you'll enter an area based on an English national park called Exmoor. Exmoor is one of the more mountainous and hilly areas in southwestern England, and I imagine it would provide plenty of rugged terrain the player has to surpass. There's also a couple caves in Exmoor that I imagine being in this area as well. Once you've made it through the Exmoor-based area, you'll arrive at a town based off of the English cities Bath and Bristol. That's right, I couldn't decide which one I wanted to have a city based on in this region, so I ended up making a town that combines a lot of the signature features of both cities. In real life, Bristol is located on the River Avon, and due to its optimal location, has a very extensive maritime history revolving around trade shipping and being a very important seaport. It's also allegedly the birthplace of Blackbeard the Pirate, although from what I understand, that isn't 100% confirmed. Bath, on the other hand, is a landlocked city that is known not only for its Georgian-era architecture, which is very unique and made out of the golden-colored bathstone, but the city is also very popular because of the natural hot springs beneath it. In fact, during the Roman Empire, the Romans built a giant communal bathing facility, later called the Roman Baths, that utilized Bath's natural hot springs. As you can probably tell, both of these cities have a ton of history and interesting landmarks to them, and this Pokemon town based on them would essentially be an amalgam of these two real-life cities. It would be located by a river that leads out to sea and has a lot of legacy with shipping and boating, but would also have natural hot springs that helped form areas based on the Roman baths. Both sides of the city would be pretty important, as the gym leader would have ties to the ocean side while the evil team would have ties to the Roman bath side, and I think this Pokemon town would do a great job at combining both cities. Alright, let's go back to Princetown's branching path and go down the southbound route. This would take you to the southern coast of the region and to a village based on a place called West Lulworth. This town would be built around a giant cove, in reference to Lulworth Cove, and while the town wouldn't be huge, it would offer a couple notable points of interest, like a building based on Lulworth Castle, and an old-fashioned, slightly larger Pokemon Center meant to resemble the Castle Inn, which is an old pub dating back to the 16th century. When you eventually leave town, you'll arrive at one of, if not the biggest, non-city landmark in the region, which is based off of Stonehenge. This mysterious rock formation has stumped people for eons, and obviously an England Pokemon region has to have an area based on it. No spoilers just yet, but many dragon types will be found hanging around this area, although nobody quite knows why. Carrying onward from the Stonehenge area would take you through a pretty long route until you end up in the Pokemon world's equivalent of London. London is the largest and capital city of not only England, but the United Kingdom as a whole, and it has quite a legacy to it. It was initially built by the Romans way back when they had control of most of Great Britain, and after the Roman Empire fell, the town was re-established and evolved through the presence of many groups of people until it became the modern-day London we see today. 
That's a really, really condensed history of London, but the bottom line is that the city is very historic in many ways, and you can get a sense for the town's legacy just by looking at its numerous points of interest. There's the London Eye Observation Wheel towering above the city, the Big Ben Clock Tower at the end of the Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace where the Queen lives, the River Thames going right through the city with the Tower Bridge going across it, an aquarium, classic theatres, the British Museum, Trafalgar Square, and the list goes on and on. With so many landmarks and cool things in London, it made thinking of what a London Pokemon city could be like a little bit of a challenge. London is a huge city that carries a sense of majesty to it, and I really thought hard about what the Pokemon World version of it could be like. What I ended up coming up with for this town is that I think it could be split up into two very distinct sections. The first area would make up the majority of the city and would be located on a large river in reference to the Thames. The heart of the town would be built around an open area resembling Trafalgar Square, and there would be many buildings surrounding you, such as a Pokemon Center, a gym, a location based on the London Eye that you can ride on, a place based on the Houses of Parliament with the Big Ben Clock Tower, and then a very modern looking building resembling the Shard, which is the tallest building in the UK. Towards the side of the town by the river would be a bridge based on the Tower Bridge, and if you decide to cross it, this will get you to the second area I thought of for this London city. Which, and this is where things get a little bit crazy, would be based on Buckingham Palace and would actually be the region's Pokemon League. Seeing as how London is such a big and grandiose city, I felt like the Pokemon version of it would have to have a similar amount of grandeur and gravitas. And I think having a section of the city based around Buckingham Palace and being the region's Pokemon League location would be the best way to show the city's importance to the region. Now you might be thinking, well, that's all fine and good, Mr. Buddy, but how would a Victory Road work with this Pokemon League? And I'm glad you brought that up because Buckingham Palace has a large garden located nearby, and I think this region's Victory Road could be loosely based on that garden and be a giant maze you have to go through. A Victory Garden, if you will. Now this wouldn't be a normal garden maze that we've seen before from Pokemon. This would be as expansive as a Victory Road normally is, and there would be various puzzles, tunnels, and obstacles you have to go through that really turn this garden into an endgame labyrinth you have to overcome. Now once again, Victory Garden and the Buckingham-based Pokemon League would be areas that you don't get to see until the very end of the game when you have all 8 gym badges and have dealt with the region's evil team. Until then, the Royal Guards won't let you get to the maze to begin your final trial and confront the Elite Four. Alright, moving south from the London-based city would take you to a town inspired by the city Brighton. Now Brighton, otherwise known as Brighton and Hove, is a very popular seaside resort town that's located right on the coast. It gained notability in the Georgian era as a fashionable seaside resort where King George IV spent much of his time and built the Royal Pavilion, and has grown steadily in size and popularity ever since. I have a lot of ideas for how this city could be adapted into a Pokemon town, so I'm just gonna go through and break it down piece by piece. First of all, I think this town could have a very upper class feeling to it. Considering that King George IV and many of the subsequent rulers of England used the Royal Pavilion for many years, I think the overall feeling of this town should reflect a little bit of that high society motif. This would be a town where many of the wealthier Pokemon trainers come to relax, and you would see that with the trainer designs and overall aesthetic of the buildings. Another idea I have for this town is that I imagine most, if not all of it, being built on a giant pier in the ocean. Some of the bigger points of interest in Brighton are the many piers the town has, and I think having most of this Pokemon City built on a giant fancy pier could really make it stand out against the other seaside towns in the region. The last thing I wanted to mention about this town is some of the specific buildings and areas you would find in it. As I mentioned before, the Royal Pavilion Palace would definitely be in this town, and there would maybe be some members of the region's evil team hanging around it. A clock tower would be present in the center of the city with various stores, museums, and small gardens around it, and I think there would also be a sewer network underneath the town you could explore, in reference to real-life Brighton's vast network of Victorian-era sewers. After you leave the extravagant Brighton town, you'll travel along a route that gets increasingly desolate and barren as you go along it, until you make it to an area based on England's Dungeness Desert. This area has long been described as Britain's only desert, and I'd say that's pretty accurate because it's a very flat and arid place. While real life Dungeness does have some activity going on in it, like having a power station, small airport, and railroad, I think this Pokemon area would have a couple references to those places, but would really accentuate the sparsity and aridness of this headland. There would be many abandoned boats and houses scattered throughout the area, as well as plenty of desert-loving Pokemon to catch. 
Since this desert area is a dead end, let's go back to the London town and instead travel northeast from it. Going this way will lead you to a town based on Cambridge. Cambridge is a city well known for its prestigious Cambridge University, and I think this Pokemon town would have its own version of the university as its standout location. Both the region's professor and the town's gym leader would conduct research at this large university, and there would also be some other intriguing things here as well, such as the meteorites tied to Deoxys, people from the nearby Kalos region conducting research on Zygarde, and researchers doing experiments with Ultra Space and Ultra Wormholes. From Cambridge, if you go northeast, you'll end up in a town based on Norwich. This town is located on the River Wensum and for a long time was the second largest city in England right after London. Some of the cool things in Norwich that could be translated into a Pokemon town is a giant gate called the St. Ethelbert's Gate, many old medieval structures like Cow Tower and Norwich Castle, and numerous parks scattered throughout the town's general area. I also think this town could include a giant trainer school based on one of the town's preparatory academies, which would also double as the town's gym. Going back to Cambridge and traveling straight up will get you to a town inspired by Nottingham. This city has many interesting features in it like numerous parks, including the Arboretum, a Victorian park with trees dating back to the 1800s, Nottingham Castle, which is located upon a high hilltop, various museums like the Natural History Museum and an Industrial Museum, and there's also a couple art galleries. Normally I'd say this is enough to base a town on for this region, but Nottingham also has two other very unique things to it that I think could really spice up this Pokemon city. The first is that a vast network of caves lies beneath Nottingham. These caves have been in use for over a thousand years and have been used for a variety of things ranging from a medieval tannery to air raid shelters. Now whether this area in the Pokemon town is somewhere you can freely explore, or perhaps the town's gym is based around this, I never quite decided. But this cave system is way too unique to not put into a Nottingham based town. The other distinct thing about Nottingham is that it's linked pretty heavily with the legend of Robin Hood, a daring outlaw who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. And the city has statues, festivals, museums, and even streets dedicated to Robin Hood and the legends around him. I feel like Robin Hood would have to be involved with a Nottingham based town in some way, and I think the gym leader of this town could be based off of the heroic outlaw. We'll talk more about him in the story section, but to give a little bit of a sneak peek, I definitely think this gym leader would be doing his best to help people, although his actions may have made a few enemies, especially with the region's evil team. When you end up leaving the Nottingham town, you'll travel through a place based on the Sherwood Forest, which is a large royal forest with ties to the legend of Robin Hood, and after you go through it, you'll arrive at a city based on Sheffield. Now this is one of the places I took a pretty big creative liberty with, because I think the entirety of this Sheffield based town could have a very steampunk aesthetic to it. I know this is quite a jump for the region, and hopefully I haven't lost anybody yet, but if you'll allow me to, I'd like to go through and explain my thought process on this, and why I think steampunk not only works well with this region, but why Sheffield is the perfect city to adopt this style. So steampunk, for those who don't know, is a type of aesthetic that incorporates a lot of technology and fantasy elements inspired by the steam-powered machinery that came with the rise of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. One of the quirks of steampunk is that most of the time, steampunk draws very heavily from Victorian England's fashion and styles, which makes sense because the Industrial Revolution started in Britain. Because the Industrial Revolution is so important to England and Britain's history, and considering that steampunk is one of my favorite visual styles and is linked heavily with the Industrial Revolution, I thought it made perfect sense to have one of the towns in this region referencing both of these things. Now why I chose Sheffield to represent steampunk and a very industrial style is because in the 19th century, Sheffield gained international reputation for its steel production. So much so that it was even known as the Steel City and many innovations were developed there, like stainless steel in the Crucible. With such an industrial history to it, I knew this would be the best place to embody the steampunk style for the region. Now even though the entire town has a steampunk vibe to it, many of the buildings and places in it are still inspired by things from the real life city. There would be art galleries and museums that give a glimpse at the city's production tied history, a shopping area based on Meadow Hall where you can pick up items for your journey and some steampunk inspired clothing, and a large factory type area that's constantly making new steel products that's meant to reference the town's industrial past. After getting some awesome steampunk goggles at the town's clothing store, you continue traveling north into the region, which takes you on a really long road that has a number of offshoot routes that lead to significant landmarks. The first one of these important landmarks you can access would be an area off to the right side, inspired by the Whitby Abbey. 
The Whitby Abbey is an abandoned monastery that was built in the 7th century on a cliff. And even though this might be a little bit on the nose, I think these abandoned ruins could totally be the region's dedicated spooky area. The Whitby Abbey has been the inspiration for numerous horror-related things, such as the 1897 novel Dracula, and I imagine many of these spooky undertones associated with it could bleed over into this region's area. I can totally see these ruins having an elaborate and confusing maze within them, as well as rare items and ghost-type Pokémon you can find. The other side area that would be found on this route is a place based on the Lake District National Park. This is a location in England that has numerous lakes in it, over 10 in fact, and I imagine this being the region's water-centric area. You would be able to explore the many lakes of the district by surfing between them and find all sorts of aquatic Pokémon to catch and train. Once you've made it through this slightly extended route, you'll arrive at the northernmost town in the region, which is based on Carlisle, England. Now before I detail what this Pokemon town could be like, I need to go back in time and talk about the general history of England for just a second. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the video, but a long time ago the Romans had invaded and taken control of most of Great Britain. During this time, the Romans constructed a wall in the northern part of what is now present-day England that was meant to be a defensive fortification. This wall was named Hadrian's Wall after the Roman Emperor at the time, and the town of Luguvalium was set up nearby as a place to support said wall. Eventually, the Roman Empire fell, rendering Hadrian's Wall and Luguvalium as somewhat obsolete, and the places went through some drastic changes over the years. Hadrian's Wall started to crumble and decay throughout the decades, while Luguvalium was re-established as the town of Carlisle. There's definitely quite a legacy with Carlisle and Hadrian's Wall, and I think this Pokémon town and the route that leads away from it would be heavily inspired by this part of England's history. I imagine that this region would have its own version of Hadrian's Wall in the northern part of it, and I think this Carlisle-based town could potentially be built into the wall, while the route that goes outside of it would let you walk beside the decaying and broken wall ruins. Since we've once again reached a dead end, let's go back to the branching path right before the London-based city and go up from it. This will take you to a small town based on the real-life city Oxford. Now Oxford, in real life, is mostly known for the University of Oxford, which is the oldest university in the English-speaking world. And there's also many other interesting sites in it too, like the Bodleian Library, the Radcliffe Camera Library and Radcliffe Square, and Magdalen Tower. What I decided to do with this town and university-type areas make it feel like it's very ingrained in the old legacy of the region. If you remember back to earlier, the Cambridge Towns University was meant to feel very modern and study a lot of the newer innovations and ideas out there, and I made a very conscious decision that this Oxford town could take the opposite approach and focus more on the traditional past of the region. I imagine a large library based on the Bodleian Library being the focus of this town, with other museums and buildings of study built around it. The next town you encounter would be based on a city in England called Stratford-upon-Avon. This town is located on the River Avon and is pretty famous because this is where the well-known playwright William Shakespeare was born. His birthplace has been preserved and there's even a special theatre in town called the Royal Shakespeare Theatre dedicated to him and his plays. Obviously, these things would have a hand in shaping this Pokémon town, and I feel like the gym leader could have a very Shakespearean design that would work perfectly with the town's gym which would double as a giant theatre inspired by the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. Going north once again would lead you to a town based on the city of Manchester. Manchester is one of the largest cities in England and offers many sights to see and things to do. Some of the places I imagine the Pokémon equivalent of Manchester having is a version of the Midland Hotel that you can go in and explore, a football and sports arena based on the Old Trafford that you can enter and challenge the athletes to a battle, a specialty clothing store based on the Hatworks, an exhibit that recreates a Victorian hat factory, and a somewhat open space based on Albert Square, which is a public square in the center of Manchester that has the Town Hall. When you decide to leave town and head east, you'll go through a route and area based on the Peak District. The Peak District is one of England's most mountainous areas and is one of the few places in England that gets a fair amount of snowfall. This would be the region's resident snow area, and would provide a colder climate compared to the rest of the region and ice-type Pokémon you can encounter. On top of just being a standard ice-type area, I've also taken a few creative liberties with how the area is laid out and what exactly it's like. Brace yourselves, cause this is gonna sound crazy, but I think this area could mostly be based around a vast labyrinth of ice caves. 
While the Peak District in real life does have caves and caverns, they're not really as icy as they would be in this region, and why I'm making such a drastic change from real life is so that another thing we're about to talk about will tie better into this route. Okay, to explain this next thing for the area, we're gonna have to briefly go back to Manchester. In Manchester, there's a beer company that holds something called an Ice Cave Rave. Basically, they create a man-made ice cave, bring in a DJ, and, as the name implies, hold a rave that technically takes place in an ice cave. I thought the overall idea of this ice cave rave sounded really unique and cool, and so I decided to include an area inspired by this event within the Peak District area. Amidst the vast network of ice caves you have to go through, there would be a rave happening somewhere inside the cave you could find by following the music being played. On top of that though, because it's not enough to have a giant ice cave maze with a rave inside of it, the Manchester gym leader is actually the head DJ of the ice cave rave. We'll talk more about her and her background as well as the other gym leaders later in the video, but essentially she's a DJ from a faraway region who not only set up a rave in the route's ice cave, but became a temporary gym leader for the region. Alright, we've almost looked at all the places I thought of for the region, but there's one last area we should cover, and that's the place you unlock when you reach the post-game. After beating the Pokemon League, you'll be able to catch a boat ride that will take you to an island in the far south of the region based on the Isle of Wight. This island is one of the popular destinations of England, and is well known for its many beaches, dense gardens, old military forts, and antique castles. I picture this island being very similar to the Battle Resort from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, although it would be a little bit bigger and have a few more areas to explore. I think this would be a very warm island you get to traverse and would have a moderately large forested area, inspired by Shanklin Chine, a small village that draws inspiration from the area Ventnor, and then a large structure based on the Osborne House, which was Queen Victoria's summer home that would essentially function like a battle tower type area. And that's all the locations I thought of for an England Pokemon region. This is one of the bigger Pokemon regions I've made, at least in terms of towns, locations, and routes, and if I'm being honest, I didn't expect to put so many of them in. When I started doing extensive research on England, I found that the country had a lot more interesting and historic places in it than I originally expected, and I did my best to try and put in as many as I could, while also representing the modern day side of England too. Even though I added in some of my own ideas and interpretations to some of these places, I feel like the England region I've crafted represents the country pretty well, and shows off England's history as well as just what the country's many towns and landmarks could be like in the Pokemon world. Alright, let's talk about all the new Pokémon that could end up being in an England-based Pokémon region. For this region's new Pokémon assortment, I wound up taking a lot of inspiration from the mythology and folklore found in not just England, but the entire United Kingdom. At its core, this is still an England Pokémon region, so I tried to make the bulk of new Pokémon representative of the country, but it is worth noting that some of the other Pokémon, including the legendaries, do draw upon a little bit of Scottish and Welsh legends. As far as specifics go, I came up with 28 different Pokémon that could inhabit the region's many environments. Three starter Pokémon with their evolutions, four regional variants, 13 common Pokémon, and two legendaries. As always, I'll make sure to go over what the Pokémon is based on, its typing, and of course what abilities it could have as well. To start us off, let's look at the regional variants. I'm sure you guys are sick of me saying this, but at this point in time I have to clarify that we have no idea if regional variants, such as the Lolan forms, are going to carry on in the franchise moving forward. Assuming they do, however, and that we'll continue to see interesting versions of Pokémon that have adapted to different regions, these are all the ideas I have for what Pokémon could get regional variants in an England region. First up, let's take a look at regional variants for Flabebe, Floet, and Florgus that are Grass Fairy type. These variants are inspired by daffodils and are also meant to reference Britain and France's connection to each other in real life. In the real world, France and England have had a very interesting relationship with each other. I won't bore you guys by going over the entire history between the two, but one of the big highlights is that after a complicated history of war between them in the 1400s, they developed a peaceful coexistence with each other in the 1900s and relations between them grew fairly close with many pieces of art, fashion, and culture being exchanged back and forth. While this relationship has changed a little bit in recent years, with the countries growing somewhat distant, I still wanted this England Pokémon region to have that kind of connection with the France-based Kalos region. 
I thought the best way to reference this connection between them was to have a Kalos native Pokemon get an English regional variant. After looking through all the Kalos Pokemon, I decided that the Flabebe line would work the best with the New England regional form, and I gave them a typing of Grass Fairy coupled with the ability Chlorophyll. The other regional variant I thought of for this region is a variant of Lycanroc inspired by a creature in folklore known as Raynardine. In English folklore, Raynor Dean is a werewolf known to seduce people and take them to his castle where their fates are left up to the listener's imagination. I like to imagine a scenario where he has a delightful brunch with them and serves them tea, but I'm sure what really happens is that Raynor Dean kills and eats them. Before said bad stuff happens though, Raynor Dean is said to be a very classy and wooing werewolf, and I thought Lycanroc could have a regional variant in this region that represents Raynor Dean's classiness. It would have a typing of Rock Fairy as well as the ability Cute Charm, which makes enemy Pokemon that come in contact with it become infatuated by it. I know Lycanroc already has three forms, so a fourth probably wouldn't be the most exciting thing for a lot of people, but since this form would have a different typing and ability compared to the others, I think it would offer something just different enough to be a little bit more exciting. Next up, let's talk about all the common Pokemon you would see in the region. These are the new Pokemon that aren't regional variants, starter Pokemon, or legendaries, and would be pretty easy to find out in the wilds of the region. The first one I want to go over is the staple rodent Pokemon for the region, which is a normal water-type Pokemon and its evolution based on the European Water Vole. The Water Vole is a semi-aquatic rodent that inhabits burrows within rivers, ponds, and streams, and, as you might expect, are very good at swimming and diving. Considering this England region has a lot of rivers and lakes in it, I felt like the Water Vole was a fantastic animal to base a Pokemon on, and it fits pretty naturally into the mold of early game rodent within this region. For its ability, it would have either Swift Swim or Damp. The next Pokemon for this region is a fire ghost type creature based on something called the Will-o'-the-Wisp. This is a ghostly light seen by travelers at night and is something that has ties to places all around the world, but is mostly attested to in European folklore. In British folklore, the Will-o'-the-Wisp is often depicted as a mischievous spirit or fairy that leads people away from trails at night. There are many tales surrounding the creature, some of them being about the Will-o'-the-Wisp leading travelers into perilous situations, while others talk of them guarding treasure, but the common link throughout these is that this being is said to embody a ghostly flame that can disappear on a moment's whim. Pretty creepy if you ask me, and that's the general idea I have for this fire ghost type Pokemon. For its abilities, to reference the fact that it's often seen as a force that causes people to get lost in the woods, it could have a new ability called Entrancing Flame that makes it so when a Pokemon is switched in against this wisp, it possibly becomes confused. And it could also have Flame Body, which causes Pokemon that make contact with it possibly become burned. Moving on, the next Pokemon is a Grass Ghost type based on the Beast of Bodmin Moor. This Pokemon would be a loose counterpart to the Will-o'-the-Wisp Pokemon and is inspired by the legend of a large, ferocious phantom cat that lives in the grasslands of Coronal and slays the livestock of the area. The typing might seem a little bit weird for this one, so let me break it down quickly. The ghost typing comes from the idea of it being a phantom cat. In real life, a phantom cat is a large feline, such as a cougar or leopard, that appears outside of its indigenous area. That's what the Beast of Bodmin Moor allegedly is, and I took the name a little bit literally for this Pokemon based off of it, which is where its ghost typing comes from. The grass typing, on the other hand, comes slightly from the fact that the Bodmin Beast is said to inhabit a large moor, but is mostly inspired by something called the Green Man, which is a sculpture or representation of a face made out of leaves. This is one of the popular ideas in England's art and architecture, and I merged it into the Bodmin Beast concept to give the secondary typing of grass. For this Phantom Cat's ability, I think it could have a brand new one I'm calling Dissipate, which allows the Pokemon to use its ghost-like traits to dissipate into the air and reduce the amount of damage it takes from flying-type moves. Next up is one of my favorite new Pokemon for the region, which is a ground-type boar Pokemon and its pre-evolution, based off of England's wild boar with a little bit of Roman Centurion flair thrown in for good measure. We've talked a lot throughout this video about England's history with the Romans, and that's something I wanted these boar Pokemon to represent. The general idea is that this Pokemon was originally introduced to the region hundreds of years ago when a group of Poke Romans invaded and brought this Pokemon line along. The Poke Romans' history mirrors real life history, and they ended up retreating from this England region, but the boar Pokemon they brought along adapted and became part of the region's normal Pokemon assortment long after their initial trainers left. 
For their abilities, I wanted something that referenced how dedicated and warrior-like these Pokemon are. So I think something like Weak Armor, which makes it so that when a Pokemon is hit by a physical attack, their defense is lowered but their speed is raised, or Stamina, which raises a Pokemon's defense every time it's hit, would work well with this Pokemon line. Moving on, we have a Pokemon based on an insect called the Blandford Fly. This is a type of fly found within Europe, and it actually got its name because way back in the 1970s, there was a huge outbreak of fly bites near the town of Blandford, England, where around 600 people were bitten by this fly and had to go to the hospital for treatment. It was a pretty crazy incident and shows off just how rabid this species of fly can be. It's almost reminiscent of mosquitoes in a way because it seeks out blood to suck. And that struck me as kind of sinister. So sinister, in fact, that I think a Pokemon based on the Blandford fly could have a typing of Bug Dark and a new ability called Bloodsucker that makes it so that when this Pokemon uses bite moves like Bite or Crunch, they have a slight lifesteal effect to them that allows this Pokemon to recover a small amount of health. Coming up next is a line of Pokemon based around chickens. To be more specific, the base form is a normal type Pokemon based around a baby chick, and then it has a branching evolution where if it's male it becomes a normal fighting type rooster very loosely inspired by the old English game Fowl, and if it's female it becomes a normal fairy type hen. For their abilities, the first form would have Shell Armor, which protects the Pokemon from critical hits. The Rooster would have the ability Moxie, which raises its attack when it knocks out an enemy Pokemon. And the Hen Pokemon would have a new ability called Maternal Love, which essentially acts like the Healer ability, and would give the Pokemon a chance to heal status effects of ally Pokemon, and as an added bonus would allow eggs to hatch faster. The final three common Pokemon of the region are all part of the same evolution line and, more important than that, act as the pseudo-legendary for the region. This Pokemon line is meant to be seen alongside other strong pseudo-legendaries out there like Dragonite, Hydreigon, and Garchomp, and the final form stats will be very comparable to them. As far as what these actual Pokemon are based on, they're very influenced by the concept of the Industrial Revolution as well as Steampunk. We talked earlier about why steampunk and the Industrial Revolution are so rooted in England's culture, and alongside having an entire city in this region with that kind of style, I felt like these three Pokemon could also represent that kind of aesthetic and really push that heavy industrial vibe. For this Pokemon line's ability, I thought of a brand new one called Steam Powered, which makes it so that anytime these Pokemon are hit by a water type move, their attack and special attack are raised by one stage. That's all the common Pokemon I thought of for the region, so let's switch gears now over to the region starter Pokemon. These are the three Pokemon you get to choose from at the start of the game, and whichever one you go with would be your very first Pokemon to accompany you through this England region. First up, we have the Fire type starter, which is based on a Bulldog, and by its final evolution turns into a Fire Steel type. Bulldogs actually originated in England and are seen by some to be a national icon for the country. With such deep ties to England, I knew this breed of dog would make for great inspiration for one of the starters, and its ability would be the classic fire starter ability of Blaze, and then its hidden ability would be Intimidate. The second starter is the Water Starter, which is loosely inspired by the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. This is one of the Pokemon in the region that draws a little bit from the general UK culture, and while its first form might look a little more eel-like, by its final evolution it becomes a dual water poison type and resembles Nessie a lot more than when you first receive it. Ability-wise, it gets Torrent, and then for its hidden ability, I think it could have Swift Swim. The final starter of the region is a grass-type rabbit Pokemon that's meant to resemble the European Rabbit. Kind of an interesting history with this rabbit in England, because the European Rabbit is what's called an invasive species. And when it was first introduced to England by the Romans back in 43 AD, this species of rabbit caused many disastrous effects to England, like damaged crops and even houses getting destroyed due to the animals burrowing. Nowadays, the European rabbit is generally alright, but to reference its initial introduction to England, I think this grass-type starter line could grow a little more aggressive and intimidating throughout its forms, slowly becoming part fighting type, in reference to the idea of an invasive species taking over things. Finishing up the new Pokémon section, let's go over the two main legendaries that would be the stars of this England region. They're both inspired by mythical creatures, and the main idea they represent is the concept of corruption versus purity. It's not quite as grey area as some of the other legendaries have been in the past, but both of them do tie into the overall narrative pretty well, which we'll go over a little later in the video. 
Alright, the first legendary to talk about is a poison dragon type creature based on the myth of St. George and the Dragon. This is a tale that has ties to many places in Europe, and the quick overview of it is that long ago a venom-spewing dragon crawled out of a toxic bog and started terrorizing the countryside, until a nobleman by the name of St. George came in and slayed the dragon. This legendary is meant to be heavily based on that poisonous dragon that came from the pond, and I imagine this dragon Pokemon is a creature that is constantly spewing a poisonous haze that corrupts and pollutes wherever it goes. For its ability, I really wanted to accentuate the whole poisonous blight vibe it's got going on, and I think this legendary Pokemon could have an ability called Poisonous Air, which due to this dragon constantly emitting a noxious toxin, would make it so that any Pokemon sent out against it would have a chance to become automatically poisoned. The other legendary of the region is a Water Fairy type Pokemon based on a Unicorn. The unicorn is often seen as a symbol for Scotland, and can be seen on the royal coat of arms for the country as well as the royal coat of arms for the entire United Kingdom. In mythology, unicorns are often seen as beings of pure of heart, and what better animal to contrast a bile-inducing dragon than a light-bringing unicorn? As I mentioned earlier, this legendary and the dragon one have a pretty interesting relationship to each other that plays out within the region's story, and this unicorn legendary is the only Pokemon with enough purity to wash away the venomous toxins the dragon legendary emits. Tying into said cleansing theme, I think this legendary could have an ability called Celestial Rain, which would summon rain that has a low chance to heal a Pokemon's status effects, either yours or your opponent's, and would also have a very slight life healing effect to it. And these are all the new Pokemon I thought of for an England-based Pokemon region. Hopefully it wasn't too off-putting for some of the region's Pokemon to come from the United Kingdom's mythology in general, but I think all these Pokemon could work really well within an England Pokemon region and unite together to make the new Pokemon assortment of the region really shine. Now that we know all about the locations and Pokemon that could be in the region, I think it's finally time we go over what the story and narrative of an England Pokemon region could be like, as well as a lot of the important characters you would see throughout it. If this is your first regional video of mine that you're watching, it's worth noting right up front that I tend to go a little bit overboard with the stories in my regions, so this is a warning that what you're about to witness is super fan fiction-y, extremely long, and filled with all sorts of cheesy dialogue, but if I'm being honest, I wouldn't have it any other way for my regional videos. Now before we jump in and go through the entire story, I wanted to briefly go through some of the things I was inspired by when crafting this region's narrative. There's a few specific events from England's history and mythology that I channeled into this region's story, and I wanted to quickly go over what they are in detail so when we're in the story overview, you'll know what plot details are referencing things from real life. So the first thing I drew heavily from for the narrative was the Roman invasion of Great Britain. We've been talking all throughout this video about how the Roman invasion back in 43 AD would influence the region in terms of locations and Pokémon, and the reason why I included so many references to it was because it also plays a pretty big part in the story of the region. We'll talk about it more soon, but the general idea is that this England Pokémon region parallels real-life Great Britain, and in its ancient past it was invaded by a group of Poké-Romans who left their mark on the region in many ways before retreating from the area. The next thing I took inspiration from for this story is the legend of St. George and the Dragon. We briefly touched on this in the new Pokemon section, but to summarize the myth once again, it's said that in Britain's far past, a poisonous dragon crawled out of a pond and terrorized the countryside, until a man named St. George came in and slayed the dragon. How I translated this myth into the region's story is that I drew heavily upon it for not only the relationship between the two legendaries of the region, but also the region's general origin story as well. We'll be going over this in more detail pretty soon, but just keep in mind that the Legend of St. George does play a role within the story. The last thing I was inspired by for the region's overall narrative and tone was an event in England's history called the War of the Roses. This was a series of civil wars that happened during 1455 through 1487 between two royal houses trying to gain control of England. The House of Lancaster, represented by the Red Rose, and the House of York, represented by the White Rose. Now this might sound kind of familiar to a lot of people, and that's because the book series A Song of Fire and Ice and its TV show adaption Game of Thrones are inspired by these real-life events. 
While I initially thought about putting in a few small Game of Thrones references into the story, I was more inspired by the overall conflict that happened between the two houses in England's real life history, and the main narrative of this story revolves around an evil team trying to take over the region and dethrone the current Elite Four, who is having their own internal problems. These are the three main things I took heavy inspiration from for the region's story, and as I go through detail in it, you'll see a lot of their influence sprinkled throughout. Speaking of going through the story, I think it's finally time I go through what the narrative of this region could be like, so get ready, grab your popcorn, and let's go over the literally 20 pages I wrote down for what I think an England Pokemon region story could be like. Our story begins not in the present day of the Pokemon world, but instead 1,000 years in the region's past. During this ancient time, the England region was ruled over by a giant venomous dragon Pokemon. Wherever it went, decay and famine spread, and most of the inhabitants of the England region cowered in fear from this poisonous beast. Not only was this dragon Pokemon in power, but there was also a group of people who came from a far off land that worshipped and revered this dragon legendary and worked in tandem with it to control the region. For clarity's sake, I'm going to call this group of people the Poke Romans because this plot point is meant to reference ancient Rome's invasion of England. Between the legendary dragon's noxious blight and the Poke Romans taking control of the region, the ancient England region slowly became a land of hopelessness and destruction. Amidst all this desolation, however, a man by the name of George rose up, and with an ancient Pokemon he found in the Northern Lands, he set out to slay the poisonous dragon. His journey was hard, but in the end he struck down the dragon that had been plaguing the region for so long, releasing the people from their poisonous king. With the people now free from the dragon's blight, they rose up and combated the invaders that had taken over their land. Between the newfound strength of the region's locals, and the fact that the Poke Romans had been relying heavily on the poisonous dragon's strength and weren't prepared for an uprising of this magnitude, the Poke Romans ended up losing control of the region and had to retreat back to their homeland. The local inhabitants of the region celebrated that they were now free from the poisonous dragon and Poke Romans, and over the next few years set to rebuilding their society. Some places they left untouched, like the ruins where St. George slayed the dragon, but overall they set to work to improve and advance their land following the dark times they had just experienced. Jumping 1,000 years into the present day of the region now, everything is normal and fine. Over the thousand years since being ruled over by an ancient dragon and invaders from a far off land, the England region is basically 100% recovered and turned into a very modern region that also has many ties to its past. That's not to say it isn't without its problems though. The region's Pokemon League is currently having a lot of internal conflict, and that's something you would see a little bit of throughout the story. The Elite Four and Champion are kind of the regulators of this region in a sense, and lately they've been having many disagreements on how to manage the region. Some of them feel like how they've been running things so far is fine, but after hearing about what happened in the nearby Kalos region with Team Flare, some of the others feel like they need to become a little bit harsher with their governing. While nothing drastic has happened yet, it's clear that there's a slight rift forming between the five of them, which has been slightly affecting the region. Although most of the smaller villages away from the London town wouldn't even feel the effects of the Pokemon League's problems. Speaking of small towns, this is where the player, aka you, comes into the story. At the beginning of the game, you start out in the small Truro-based town, and it's established that you and your family are Pokemon breeders that have lived there your entire life. It's a very small rustic town known for its farming and Mareep wool export, and the player lives on a small Mareep farm just outside of town. The game opens up with your mother excitedly telling you that the town is going to be holding a small play at the Minic Theater location, and the village's mayor has asked your family to help provide materials for the event. Your mother asks you to make a delivery to the mayor, and that's what gets you out of the house and into the town for some light exploration. After exploring your farm and a little bit of the surrounding area, you make your delivery to the mayor and decide to head home. While you're on your way back, you run into one of your neighbors from a farm nearby, a kid named Richard, and while the two of you don't know it yet, he's your main rival for the region. Richard is a little bit cheeky, but he also has a good heart and big dreams. He talks all the time about how he wants to get away from his life of farming and go out on a real Pokemon journey like he's heard about from so many other people. He says not to tell his parents, but he's actually been secretly training his own Pokemon, which will later turn out to be the starter Pokemon effective against yours, in the hopes that someday he might become strong enough to leave this small town behind and make it to the London city and take on the top trainers of the region. 
Richard jokingly challenges you to a battle because he knows you don't have a Pokemon when suddenly a mysterious woman shows up and says that you can borrow one of hers. You and your rival are both taken aback by this because not only have you never seen this person before, but it's kinda weird for someone to mysteriously show up and let you use their Pokemon, but she assures you that there's nothing fishy going on and she's just curious if you both have the passion to be Pokemon trainers. You choose one of the three Pokemon she has available for you, which are the three starters for the region, and after you do, you and your rival have your very first battle against each other. Once it's over, the lady seems pleasantly surprised at what she witnessed, and that's when Richard hears his mom calling him home. He's shocked he's being called home so soon, and is also scared his mom found out he's been secretly training Pokemon, and rushes away very quickly. The mysterious woman turns back to you, almost bemused to see your rival so nervous at being a Pokemon trainer, and says that you can hold on to the Pokemon you borrowed from her until the big play happens tonight. She says that she's in the area to see the performance, and you can return the Pokemon to her later at the theater. After this, you return home with your new starter, and there's a time jump to later in the day. Your mother has already gone over to the play, and you're supposed to go and meet her there. This is when you actually get to do a little bit of battling, and you and your starter battle trainers and wild Pokemon on your way to the Minic Theater location. Once you arrive, you spot your mother in the bleachers, but there's strangely enough no sign of the mysterious Pokemon-giving woman. The lights dim and the curtain comes apart to reveal none other than the strange woman from earlier. She welcomes everyone to the play and introduces herself as Professor Cedar. She says that her, her colleagues, and other Pokemon have been working hard to put this show together, and throughout the play she'll even be asking for some volunteers to help her out on stage. The crowd starts whispering about what this could mean, and without further ado, the play begins. I won't go through the entire play, but the general idea of it is that it tells the backstory of the England region I explained earlier, and you and your rival are called in as volunteers to help with the performance. You and your starter get to take on the role of St. George and his legendary, while your rival and his Pokémon pretend to be an ancient king and the poison dragon legendary. You have a few battles against some weaker Pokémon, and the play closes out by you and your rival having one final battle. Once you've defeated him, the play officially ends, and most of the crowd leaves the Cliffside Theater except for you, Professor Cedar, and your mother. This is where I tried to have a little bit of a twist on the classic Pokémon formula, because when you talk to your mother after the play, she's actually having a little bit of a panic attack at the thought of you being a Pokémon trainer. Most of the moms in Pokémon are very supportive of letting their kid wander around a region and be a Pokémon trainer, but your mother in this region feels the opposite way. She talks about how dangerous being a Pokemon trainer is, and that if you're not careful, you'll end up like your father. She's also kind of upset that you got a Pokemon behind her back. And that's when Professor Cedar jumps in and tells her that she gave you the starter Pokemon, and if anyone's to blame, then blame her. The professor goes on to try and calm your mother down, and through a lot of emotional and heartfelt dialogue, which due to time I won't go through, she ends up convincing your mother that while being a Pokemon trainer is dangerous, if it's what your dream is, then she should try to be supportive. While your mother still disagrees with you being a quote-unquote dangerous Pokemon trainer, as she puts it, with the professor's convincing, she decides to let you go out on your Pokemon adventure. The professor smiles and officially lets you keep your starter Pokemon, which she reveals she was never going to take away from you, and after she also gives you a Pokedex, her and your mother wish you luck as you depart from the theater and begin your Pokemon journey. Now that you're officially traveling the region with the goal to beat gym leaders and take on the Pokemon League, you move on from the starting town to a small village based on Princetown. When you arrive, you see a mysterious individual duck out of an old telephone booth before discreetly heading into the abandoned Dartmoor prison area. You follow him into the Nature Overrun building, and you get to explore it for a while before finding the man in one of the basement rooms. He's shocked to find another person in such an abandoned area and asks what you're doing here. After you explain that you saw him stealthily walk in here, he introduces himself as Looker. He says that he's part of an organization called the International Police, and him and his partner Krogunk have been investigating some strange goings-on throughout the region. He was tracking some energy readings that were spreading through the region, and one of them led him to the basement of this decrepit building. You suddenly hear some weird shuffling behind you and notice that a couple people dressed in heavy Roman armor are in the basement as well. They look surprised to see other people down here, and Looker demands to know what they're doing here. They recover their composure and introduce themselves as members of Team Imperium, the rightful rulers of the region. 
You and the Looker give them a slightly confused expression, and the Grunts get frustrated that you don't recognize their majesty. They demand that you leave the building at once, so they can search it for what they're looking for. That piques Looker's interest, and he turns back to you and says that if they're here looking for something, then it must be related to the strange energy reading that brought him here too. He says that no matter what, you can't let them find whatever they're after, and so you engage in a battle against the two Team Imperium Grunts. On their team, and this goes for all of the Team Imperium Grunts, they use a blend of electric and poison type Pokemon ranging from Pikachu, Mareep, and Shinx, to Gulpin, Salanda, and Whirlipede. After you defeat the two Grunts, they're shocked that they lost and proclaim that by opposing them today, you have forever sealed your fate as being enemies of Team Imperium, the rightful heirs to the land. They quickly run away from you, and Looker slightly chuckles. He says that this is the fifth time he's seen a so-called evil team try to take over a region, and he's a little amused that they didn't even attempt to hide their evil side. Getting serious though, he says that even though he's seen this before, you can't underestimate them. He has a feeling that the strange happenings in the region are most likely linked to this Team Imperium group, and considering you defeated the Grunts with relative ease, he asks for your help in opposing them. Looker then turns his attention back to examining the basement, and the player decides to press forward on their journey. After going through a mountainous area and a cave, you next arrive in the Bath slash Bristol base city. You earn your first gym badge here, and after you do so, you hear somebody calling for help. You follow the distress cry, which leads you to a giant building based on the Roman baths. The person yelling for help is out front and says that they're the tour guide, and a group of people barged in and kicked everybody out. You go to enter the building to see what's going on when you're stopped out front by none other than more Team Imperium grunts. They say that you're not allowed inside and that you should know your place and leave them at once. Maybe if they asked nicer that would have worked, but since they were so rude about it, you destroy them in a Pokemon battle and push past them into the building. Once inside the baths, you see more Team Imperium members, and in the middle of a pool is a giant man that seems to be relaxing in the water. You battle a few more grunts as you try to reach him, and when you do, he passively waves you away. You keep trying to talk to him, and eventually he jumps out of the water energetically and stares you down. He says that his name is Brutus, Team Imperium's Brawn, and that after setting up their secret base, his muscles were so sore he had to take over this building just to release some of the tension. He covers his mouth and says that he probably shouldn't have said that because it makes them seem evil, but really, they're very nice people that are just trying to help the region. By taking it over. By force. Because they're better than everyone and deserve to rule it. He covers his mouth once again and starts getting really worked up because he keeps accidentally revealing very crucial secrets to you that you shouldn't know. He decides that he and his Pokemon will pummel you into the ground to keep you from talking, and this begins your first battle against Team Imperium Admin Brutus. On his initial team, he uses a Plusle Mareep and Electabuzz, and once beaten, Brutus turns stone cold. He seems visibly upset that he lost and swears vengeance on you. He rallies his troops into formation and together they march out of the building. The tour guide shows up again and thanks you for getting rid of those awful people when you suddenly hear an explosion in the distance. You run outside and find that the bridge leading out of the city has been completely destroyed. You can just barely make out Brutus and the Team Imperium grunts marching on the other side of the destroyed bridge, and it seems that Brutus might have taken his defeat against you a little bit hard. With the bridge now unfortunately out of commission, this causes you to backtrack a little ways and instead take the southern route through the region. This leads you to the Lulworth Cove town where you meet up with a familiar face. Richard, your rival! He says that after you left, Professor Cedar talked to his parents and after a lot of convincing, they said he could go out on a Pokemon journey and here he is! He says that now that you're both official trainers, you should have a legit battle against each other and that's exactly what you do. At this point in the game, Richard has the first form of whatever starter is effective against yours, a Pidgeotto, the first form of the Water Vol Pokemon, and the first form of the Boar Pokemon. As is always the case, you beat your rival in the battle, but this only serves to fire him up more. He says that he's going to keep training to become stronger, and one day he's totally going to beat you. Unfortunately, that day is not today, and Richard says that he's going to go over and check out the Roman baths, while the player opts to keep traveling forward to the Stonehenge ruins that Brutus cut you off from going to earlier. Once you make it to the ruins, you're shocked to see tons of Team Imperium grunts scattered around the area. In the middle of the ruins, you see a woman in a pink dress surrounded by numerous grunts and another girl in Roman clothing that seems to be talking to her in a slightly threatening manner. As you sneak closer, you start to hear a little bit of their conversation and the Roman woman seems to be interrogating the pink dressed one about something to do with the area. 
You hear her say that the pink dressed person is a witch that should know how to summon the poisonous beast who ruled long ago, but the pink dressed woman doesn't know what she's talking about. At that moment, one of the grunts yells about an intruder, and all eyes turn to you as you stop dead in your tracks. The Roman woman demands to know who you are and why you're here, and before you even get a chance to speak, she says that it doesn't matter, because if you're not part of Team Imperium, then what good are you? She motions to the grunts, and you get swept up in a few battles against them. Once you've defeated them and made it over to the two mysterious women, the Roman-clad one is somewhat smirking at the idea of a trainer opposing Team Imperium, and she goes off on a small tirade about how Team Imperium will unite the region and save it from its faulty leadership under the Foolish Elite Four. Amidst her rambling, she reveals that her name is Sophia, the brain of Team Imperium. She notices that you kind of zoned out during her speech, and she huffs at you and says, Fine, I'll show you why everyone in the region will submit to our rule. This begins your battle with Team Imperium Admin Sophia. On Sophia's team, she has a Minin, Solandit, Golbat, and Dragalgy, and once you've beaten her, she's left in a stupor. No one has ever defeated her, and you will pay dearly for making her precious Pokemon faint. Even though she didn't get the information she was hoping for, she calls the Imperium Grunts to her, and together they march out of the Stonehenge ruins. It's just you and the pink-dressed woman you saved in the area now, and she turns to you and thanks you for saving her. She introduces herself as Victoria, and sheepishly reveals that she's a member of the Elite Four, but forgot to bring her Pokemon with her when she was out here investigating. She says that the Elite Four got a message about this new group of radicals called Team Imperium that are descendants of ancient Poke-Romans and are trying to take over the region, and she came out here to secretly investigate them. Unfortunately, she was ambushed by Sophia, who mistook her for another member of the Elite Four, Morgana, the mythology expert, and was trying to get information out of her. Victoria laughs slightly and says that she's not sure how Sophia mixed the two of them up, but it makes sense that Morgana was most likely who she was trying to capture, because she's an expert when it comes to the region's older legends. Anyways, Victoria wants to give you a proper reward for saving her, and asks that when you have time to meet her at the Pokemon League Bridge in the London town. It's the least she can do for your kindness in saving her, and with that she departs from the ruins. After this, you yourself carry on to the London city, and once you arrive, there's all sorts of things you can do, like challenge the gym leader and explore the numerous streets and stores, and after you've had your fill with the town's activities, you decide to stop by the Pokemon League Bridge at the edge of town and meet up with Victoria. In front of the bridge, you see Victoria and a woman dressed in black, sort of creepy clothing, standing in wait for you. Victoria waves you over and right away thanks you once again for saving her and gives you a big nugget as a reward. She then turns to the person next to her and introduces them as Morgana, another one of the region's Elite Four members. She says that Morgana is the person she was talking about earlier, the one that's well versed in the region's mythology, and she wanted to talk to you. Morgana thanks you for helping Victoria and says that Team Imperium seems to be scouring the region for items related to the mythical poison legendary. She says that while a lot of people assume it's just a myth, it was indeed real and, on a slightly scarier note, could potentially be brought back to life. She's been studying many of the books at the Oxford Town's old library and they've illuminated some potential methods that could, in theory, bring the destructive legendary back to life. Some heavy information to be sure, and she quickly throws in that it's only a possibility and who knows if Team Imperium is truly going to try and do that. After all this new info has been revealed, you say goodbye to the two Elite Four members, finish up any other business you have in the London city, and then move on to the Cambridge town. Here you actually bump into Professor Cedar again, and she's quite happy to see you. She never really explained what it was that she studied back when you first met at the starting town, and she shows you around her lab at the town's giant university building. Basically, her area of research is all about Pokemon types, why Pokemon are classified as certain types, why their moves fall into those types, and some of the curious cases where a Pokemon seems like it should be one typing, but is instead something entirely different. After she explains her area of study, she introduces you to one of her colleagues in the building, which is also a gym leader you can battle. And once you earn his gym badge, you press onwards to the Nottingham based town. What should be another pleasant city to go through is taken a somewhat downward spiral. The town is crawling with Team Imperium grunts, and at the town's castle you can see many people gather below a large balcony. You go there to see what all the fuss is about, and a younger man who looks like he's most likely part of Team Imperium steps out onto the balcony. He says that his name is Nero, the grand leader of Team Imperium, and that all of you pathetic worms in the crowd have been living under the rule of weaklings for centuries. He and his group of Poke-Romans are the true heirs to the region, and their strength will guide you to the next evolution of life. 
The crowd isn't sure what to make of this, and Nero presses on. He says that once his master plan is complete, the region will go back to its state of perfection that happened 1,000 years ago. Team Imperium and all those who join them will be at the top, and anyone who opposes will be forced to the bottom. The crowd isn't too crazy about that part of his speech, and Team Imperium grunts start closing in on the large group of people. Nero says that if you give your Pokémon to us now, I'll guarantee that you shan't be harmed when the storm of poison rains down from above. This causes people to actively start freaking out now, and the grunts start taking people's Pokémon by force. Suddenly, laughter can be heard from within the crowd, and the mass of people parts to reveal a man clad in a cloak alongside another mysterious figure beside him. He taunts Nero by saying, People really believe all that, huh? Guess it's just not for me. The man sheds his cloak and reveals himself to look very close to Robin Hood. He goes on to say that he's the gym leader of this town, and if anyone messes with the people in it, then they've got to go through him and his decidui first. Nero is perplexed, not because he's scared, but because he's not sure why somebody would be wearing tights during the winter season, and he passively gestures to the grunts to take out the man. Nero disappears inside, and the grunts surround the gym leader and his decidui. The player jumps to his aid, and together you battle through the swarm of grunts. The gym leader remarks that you're pretty good at battling, and after all this is blown over, you've got to challenge him for a gym badge. Before that happens, though, you both charge into the castle to confront Nero. The entire castle has been decked out in extravagant decorations, and at the end of the hall is Nero sitting on a throne. You and the gym leader battle through a few more Imperium grunts, then run up to Nero and confront him about his evil plans. Nero is very disinterested, stifling a yawn, and says that either battle him or leave, but do not waste his time with idle talk. It's decided that the player will battle Nero while the gym leader blocks more incoming grunts, and on Nero's initial team he uses a Nidoking, Nidoqueen, Electros, and Magneton. Once defeated, he still seems unimpressed. He says that this was a gigantic waste of effort, and he has places to be and things to do. He can see it in your eyes that you'll never grovel before him, but he swears that once he's king, you will change your mind and bow to him. The screen fades to black, and when it fades back in, Nero is gone, as well as all the Team Imperium grunts in the area. The Robin Hood gym leader gives a lighthearted laugh and says that you've done great work and scared them off. He thanks you for helping him out, and as he leaves the castle says that you're more than ready to battle him for a badge, and he'll be waiting for you at his gym. The player goes to leave the castle as well, when suddenly Looker shows up. He says that he heard from the townsfolk what happened here, and he's very impressed that you were able to confront Team Imperium and even defeat their leader. Unfortunately, he hasn't sought you out to give you happy news, and says that there have been numerous reports of Team Imperium grunts stealing heavy machinery from all around the region. He's not sure why, but if he had to guess, he has a feeling that Team Imperium is planning something big. He asks you to keep a lookout and says that he'll stay in Nottingham for a while and see if they left any clues behind. After this, you battle the town's gym leader and head to the Norwich base town, and right when you arrive, Richard shows up. In classic rival fashion, he gets right to the point and challenges you to a Pokemon battle. He says that he and his Pokemon have grown so much since your first battle, and he's ready to show you his new skills. On Richard's team this time around, he has the second evolution of the starter effective against yours, a Pidgeotto, the second form of the Water Vol Pokemon, the first form of the Boar Pokemon, and a Herdier. Once defeated, he still tries to remain optimistic and fired up, but you can tell that he's getting a little discouraged from you beating him every single time. He reveals to the player that he actually came to this town because it has a region-renowned Pokémon Academy, and he was hoping to pick up a few tips from them. He also says that the town's gym leader is the headmistress of the Academy, so even though you don't need any help to beat him, you'll still have a reason to go there too. Your rival heads over to the school, and you follow right behind him. The school is split up into two sections, with one side being more of the teaching side, where Richard goes and studies, while the other is the actual gym side, where you fight students trying to get to the gym leader, Headmistress Charlotte. Once you've reached her and earned her gym badge, she somewhat lightens up a little bit and congratulates you on a solid win. She suddenly gets a phone call, and while she's on it, she seems somewhat annoyed, although a little understanding. She hangs up the phone and makes an announcement to all the students and says that all the new books she ordered will be delayed, on account of somebody breaking into the Oxford Library-based location and throwing things into disarray over there. While Charlotte and the general student body might not know what's happening, you have a pretty good hunch as to who might have done this, and you leave the academy behind to travel to the Oxford town. On the way there, you go through the Stratford-upon-Avon town and beat its gym leader, and then you arrive at the Oxford town's library. 
When you go inside, Charlotte wasn't lying when she said it was thrown into disarray because the entire building looks like a tornado went through it. In the middle of the wreckage are two people looking around at everything solemnly. One of them you recognize as Morgana of the Elite Four, and the other is a rather stoic looking knight. You approach them, and the knight introduces himself as Arthur, the reigning champion of the region. He says that the Pokemon League was alerted to this crime moments ago, and he and Morgana rushed here as fast as possible, but alas, they were too late to stop the criminals from their heinous deeds. Morgana jumps in and says that whoever came here stole all the books relating to the region's mythology, including some of the books from the Poke Roman times that detail the mythical poison dragon. Between Team Imperium trying to get information out of Victoria about the process of resurrecting the dragon, and the fact that now all the books relating to the Poison Legendary have been stolen, Morgana fears that Team Imperium may have actually found a way to revive the Legendary that should be gone forever. Arthur grimaces at the sound of that. He openly admits that he felt the region was doing fine before, which is why he didn't agree with some of the Elite Four members that said they needed to be more strict. But now he's changed his mind. He says that the region is to be on high alert now, and he and the Elite Four will be going to various places around the region to guard them from Team Imperium. He hates asking people for help in matters such as this that he should be able to control, but Arthur asks that if you're able to, help protect the region and stop Team Imperium. With that, both he and Morgana rush out of the destroyed library to go off and protect the region. The player goes to leave the library when Looker bumps into you once again. He's shocked to see you here, but says this is remarkable timing. He cuts right to the chase and says that he might have a lead as to where Team Imperium is hiding. He's been tracking the strange energy reading since back when you met in Princetown, and there seems to be a very high concentration of it to the south of the London town in the Brighton-based city. He's not 100% positive this is where Team Imperium is, but he feels like there's a high chance their hideout could be located within the city. Looker says that he'll catch up with you there later as he has to report his findings to his superiors, and with that, the player goes to the Brighton City. After exploring it for a while, the only unusual thing you find is that the town's castle is supposed to be abandoned and open to the public, but it's strangely locked up tight and some of the lights are on inside of it. Since you can't go in through the front gate, you instead have to go through the town sewer system to try and find a way in. Luckily enough, nobody ever thinks to check the sewers, and you're able to find an open vent that leads into the allegedly abandoned Brighton Palace. Although it's not really abandoned, what should be a dusty, broken down building instead looks surprisingly modern. Many high-tech machines contrast the fancy Victorian-era decor, and there's also, you guessed it, tons of Team Imperium scientists and grunts hanging around. You're sure that Nero and his admins are somewhere in here, so you get to work battling through the many Imperium members before you finally enter the building throne room. To the surprise of no one, Nero is sitting nonchalantly on the throne while Brutus and Sophia are working some high-tech machines in the middle of the room. There's a giant purple contraption in the center with some strange glowing liquid. Nero, without getting up from his throne, gives the player a slow, sarcastic clap. Well done, trainer. You were able to find our headquarters. Not even the bumbling fools of the Pokemon League were able to do that. Surely that's another sign as to this region needing my strong hand guiding them to success. He notices your determination and says that, oh, you must have figured out our plan now, huh? While we do have vast numbers and a great amount of strength, if we waged open war on this region, we would surely lose to trainers like you. Although that now changes. Soon I shall have revived the great dragon of the region and using its power, all shall bow before me. I know you're going to try and stop me and we'll have a showdown. But before that happens, I shall have Brutus and Sophia stall you while I go claim my prize and my region. I'll see you soon, trainer. With that, Nero strolls out of the room and Brutus and Sophia leave the mysterious machines they were operating to come and battle you. Brutus is amped up at the chance to fight you again, and Sophia seems a little more reserved this time, but even she can't hide her smirk at the thought of destroying you in a Pokemon battle. Brutus challenges you first, and on his team uses a Plessel, Ampharos, Maynectric, and Electivire, while Sophia challenges you after you beat Brutus and uses a Minin, Salazzle, Crobat, and Dragalge. Once defeated, the two of them have very different reactions. Brutus starts brooding and laments if he's joined the wrong side. Nero told him Team Imperium would only win because they were right, and yet he's lost almost every single battle since he joined them. Maybe this isn't the right thing. Maybe he really is a bad guy. As Brutus keeps monologuing his thoughts, Sophia, who feels similarly to Brutus but shows some more through her expressions, quietly slips out of the room undetected. 
Amidst Brutus' self-inflection, Looker finally arrives on scene and tells you good work. He shuts down whatever the purple ooze machine is, which snaps Brutus back to the present. He looks around panicked and yells out for Sophia, who he didn't notice had already escaped. Looker quickly leaps beside him and puts him under arrest. In the shock of the moment, Brutus blurts out anything and everything he can think of to not get arrested, including an interesting detail about another one of the region's legendaries. According to Brutus, Team Imperium was planning to capture the mythical unicorn legendary of the region's lakes, but Nero decided not to because he felt like the power of the resurrected poison legendary would drastically overpower it. Looker is stunned at the amount of important info Brutus just shared, and while he's still going to arrest him, he does thank him for his help. Looker then asks if he can see your map, and he marks the Lake District area on it. He says that this is the place Brutus mentioned the other legendary of the region residing at, and if you want to, you can go try to capture it to help in the upcoming showdown. Looker says it's ultimately the player's choice, and regardless of what you do, Looker will meet you at the Stonehenge area after he's taken Brutus in and alerted everybody about Nero's plan. Assuming the player wants to seek out the legendary to challenge Nero with, you'll head north of the Stratford-upon-Avon town, go through the city based on Manchester, go through the ice caves getting the opportunity to challenge another gym leader, and take an offshoot cave from them that leads to the Lake District. Once there, your goal is simple. Find the Water Fairy Unicorn Legendary and capture it to use in your confrontation against Team Imperium's leader. The catch to this is that the Legendary is a random encounter in the area, and you first have to find out which one of the many lakes it's inhabiting and then surf on the water to try and encounter it. Once you've caught the Legendary, you go to the Stonehenge location and find that there's already a lot of people there. Hundreds of Team Imperium grunts have formed a barricade around the ruins, and people you've seen on your adventure like the Gym Leaders, Looker, and the Elite Four members are all gathered in a crowd outside of the General Ruins area. In the middle of the ruins, you see Nero alongside a machine that looks like the one in Team Imperium's hideout. He has one of the biggest grins on his face as he addresses the crowd of people. He thanks everyone for coming and gives a special shout out to the Elite Four. He says he's glad they made the trip out here to see who the new king of the region will be, and no hard feelings, but once he's taken control, they're going to be banished for eternity. This tips Arthur over the edge, and he rebukes Nero and everything he's trying to accomplish. He calls out his Pokémon, as do all of the gym leaders and Elite Four members, and they openly battle the hundreds of Team Imperium grunts as they try to reach Nero. The player arrives on scene, and amidst the gigantic showdown happening, Arthur says that he and everyone else will keep the grunts occupied, and you have to go challenge Nero. The player rushes to Nero, still battling a few grunts protecting him, and you finally come face to face with the Maniacal Emperor. He scoffs at the player and says, Oh, you poor misguided child. Haven't you realized it yet? Even you are stronger than your region's pathetic Pokemon League. The player doesn't back down from him, and Nero smirks because he knew it would always come to this. He tells you to show him the strength you have, and maybe he won't banish you when he rules over the region. And your final battle with Team Imperium Emperor Nero then begins. On Nero's final team, he uses a Nidoking, Nidoqueen, Drapion, Electros, Electrode, and Magnezone. Once you've beaten him, he erupts into laughter and says that even in defeat, he still won. He says that he was only trying to stall you and that the legendary dragon is about to be reborn. It will be even stronger than before and nobody, not even him, will be able to stop the blight it will bring with it. The air suddenly gets thick and the machine in the middle of the ruins pulses with a dark purple. Toxins appear to emanate out of the machine and everyone in the area starts coughing. A piercing... <laughs> is heard, and the machine erupts into a purple and white fog that envelops the ruins. It recedes a little bit, and amidst the cloud of smoke and debris, you lay eyes on what can only be described as a legendary. It lets out another piercing cry, and you notice that the legends are true, and Toxin is constantly being emitted by it. Aside from the creepy breathing sounds the dragon is making, the entire ruins have fallen silent. Could this be the moment where the England region succumbs to a storm of poison and decay? Suddenly somebody yells out, Oi! Kick its arse, mate! Everyone turns and it's Richard! He's cheering you on and telling you that you've got this. Don't let that poison blighter destroy the region. The crowd of people is stunned at Richard's excitement, but soon they join in with his confidence in you and everyone starts cheering you on as you face off against the blight bringing abomination. Your showdown against this legendary would be somewhat comparable to the Ultra Necrozma battle from Ultra Sun and Moon, where it would legitimately feel like a boss battle. The legendary's stats would be raised, and its ability would be slightly altered, and make it so every Pokémon that gets called out against it gets automatically poisoned. You also wouldn't be able to capture the Pokémon at this time, and would instead have to defeat it. 
Once you've beaten the creature, it stops spewing its poisonous bile and looks significantly weakened. It appears that whatever enhancements Team Imperium made to it when it was resurrected have worn off, and it flees the area, leaving a stunned Nero behind. The crowd is cheering that you were able to defeat the legendary, and amidst all the happiness, Looker emerges and confronts Nero. Looker puts him in cuffs and starts carting him away, but before they leave, Nero goes on quite a tirade, saying that this is his region. He's much more fit to rule it than the serfs who run it now. Everyone is still celebrating and paying little attention to him, and that's when Nero drops one last piece of information that's actually pretty big. He says that he wasn't actually the mastermind behind everything. Looker in the crowd looks at him confused, and he says that, Though I could have made a plan as good as this, it wasn't actually my idea. Someone sent this master plan to me, and I was merely following their guidelines. Looker looks at Nero expectantly and says, well, who was it? Another higher-up in Team Imperium? But Nero laughs and says, oh, foolish detective. It was one of them! He points at the gym leaders in Delete 4 of the region who are stunned in shock. Months ago, I got a cryptic letter from this region on the royal parchment that only the gym leaders and Pokemon League of this region use. It explained in detail how to take over the region and resurrect the legendary. Everyone is baffled by this revelation, and you see many of the gym leaders and Elite Four members looking at each other cautiously. Nero cackles, knowing that his information was quite a shock to them, and Looker decides that he said enough and quickly carts him away. There's a somewhat tense silence as Nero and Looker leave, but Richard breaks it when he rushes up to you and says that you were awesome. He wishes he could be as strong as you, and just because you beat a big strong legendary doesn't mean you're the best trainer yet. He rushes off excitedly to get back to training and hopefully catch up to you. After Richard leaves, Arthur and Victoria come up to the player and give their thanks as well. Arthur goes on to say, however, that if what Nero said is true and there's a traitor among the entire League, then your work might not be over just yet. Victoria brings up the idea that maybe Nero is just lying, and Arthur ponders this. He says that it's impossible to determine, and that he'll just have to keep an eye on the region even closer than before. After this, you can talk with a few of the people that are still hanging around the Stonehenge ruins, and then you decide to resume your Pokémon journey and earn your final gym badge. Now that you have all eight, you make your way through Victory Garden, this region's Victory Road, battle Richard one last time where he uses the final evolution of his starter, a Pidgeot, the second form of the Water Vol Pokémon, the second form of the Boar Pokémon, a Stoutland, and a Noivern, and then you make your way to the Pokémon League, defeat the Elite Four, and become champion of the England region. Alright, to finish out the story and characters section, let's go over the gym leaders and Elite Four of the region more in depth. We've talked about a few of them already in the story overview, but now I want to go over them specifically and talk about each of their type specialties, what they're based on, their signature Pokémon, and maybe a few stray story bits. First up, talking gym leaders, we have a water type gym leader located in the Bath slash Bristol based town, who uses a Sea King as her signature Pokémon. Her whole background is that she works in a shipping yard and is a very honest woman who works hard to make sure that all the supplies she receives are shipped out and delivered on time. Rumor has it her father was a notorious pirate who lived in the town before setting out on adventure, but she rejected the high seas lifestyle to do something a little less unlawful. Next up is a ghost type gym leader who resides in the Stratford upon Avon town and whose design is meant to pay homage to William Shakespeare. He would use the new Willow the Wisp Pokemon as his signature Pokemon, and his gym would feature a ghostly puzzle embedded in a spooky theater. After this is an electric type gym leader located in the London city, but there's a little bit of a twist with this one. My idea for the town's gym leader is to actually have three gym leaders that are all part of a punk rock band. Each of the members would give you one third of the gym badge, and they would each respectively use a Pikachu, Elekid, and Luxio. The fourth gym leader would be a Bug-type expert located at the Cambridge Town and would be one of the leading professors. His area of research is into Bug-type Pokémon, which is meant to parallel many of the famous entomologists who gained renown in England, and his signature Pokémon would be a Beedrill. The gym leader after this is a Fire-type master and is based around the headmistress of a Pokémon Trainer Academy. We talked about this earlier, but I imagine this England region would have a pretty large-scale trainer school inspired by England's numerous academies, and I think the headmistress of this trainer academy would be one of the gym leaders. After this, you would encounter a grass-type gym leader based off the legendary scoundrel Robin Hood. I talked about this guy a lot in the story overview already, so I won't go too in-depth with him, but his whole background is that he tries to fight against those in power that are doing wrong, and his main Pokémon is Decidueye. 
The next gym leader, which I've also talked about a lot, would be an ice type gym leader who runs a gym inspired by the Ice Cave Rave. She's a famous DJ who came from a faraway land and her signature Pokemon is a Weavile. I won't talk about her too much, but I'm sure that someday I'll make a video about her magical homeland. The final gym leader is a steel type master located in the steampunk inspired Sheffield City. She's one of the top engineers in the town, which surprises a lot of people due to her young age. She can more than hold her own in battle though, and uses the final evolution of the new steampunk Pokemon to crush her opponents. Switching over to the Elite Four, you might have picked up on this in the story overview, but their whole motif is that they're based around the legend of King Arthur. This is one of the biggest British legends and revolves around King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table fighting off invaders who would take over Britain. There's many characters in the legend, ranging from Arthur himself to the Enchantress Morgan Le Fay, and this Elite Four is inspired by many different people within Arthurian legend. First up is a psychic type trainer meant to embody Merlin. In Arthurian legend, Merlin was a kindly wizard who helped King Arthur, and even though it's kind of a stretch, I think his magical powers could be translated into the Pokemon world by way of being a psychic type expert. His signature Pokemon would be a Gothitelle. Next is a dark type Elite Four member based on Morgan Le Fay, known in this region as Morgana. In Arthurian legend, Morgan Le Fay is a powerful enchantress that is known to use her power for somewhat sinister means. There's been a lot of interpretations of her, but she's generally presented as a little bit of an anti-heroine and nemesis to King Arthur. Her main Pokemon would be a Malamar. After Morgana is a fighting type knight based on Sir Lancelot. He's a member of the Knights of the Round Table and is often depicted as King Arthur's greatest companion. His ace Pokemon would be a Gallade. Next we have a fairy type Elite Four member based on Guinevere, who I named Victoria in the story. In Arthurian legend, Guinevere is the wife of King Arthur, and while that's not the case in this England region, I did make her a fairy type master that would use a Florgus as her signature Pokemon. Last of all, we have the champion of the region, which is based on King Arthur himself. He wouldn't be locked to a single type, and that way could prove just how tough of a champion he truly is. His main Pokemon is Aegislash to embody the spirit of Excalibur, and he uses a variety of different Pokemon found throughout the England region. And this has been all the ideas I had for what I think England could be like as a Pokemon region. This is another one of my longer regional videos, but it makes sense because I really tried to fit a lot of England's history and culture into this Pokemon region. Many of the locations reflect England's storied past with ruins, castles, Victorian era buildings, and modern designs. Many of the Pokemon reflect the folklore and legends found throughout England and the entire UK. And of course, the story is meant to embody England's history with invasion and people vying for the throne. I know there's kind of a lot going on with this region, but hopefully I was able to capture the essence of England and even a little bit of the United Kingdom in general and make all you Brits out there proud. Anyways, what do you guys think? Do you like the idea of an England Pokemon region? Would you want to play through it? Let me know what you guys think of this England region and any other ideas you have in the comments section below. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video and I'll catch you later.